All right, everybody, welcome. And thank you so much for joining our Wednesday webinar series. Uh, looking forward to being here with you this evening. Um, and we have a, a big group here I know that's anxious and interested in learning more about coding and reimbursement. Um, so the topic tonight uh, is electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy, evolving updates for reimbursement. And you are in for a treat. Uh, you're going to be hearing from Marie Gambino, who is on the line today. Marie is a um, field reimbursement and payer relations manager who works under the medical surgical group within Medtronic. And she is our resident expert here who will be joining the, um, the call and leading the presentation today. Wanted to make sure before I turn it over to Marie, just wanted to make sure that you were all aware that um, there is a chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, definitely want to make sure that we use that so that we can answer questions as they come up. We'll, we will stop periodically throughout the presentation and make sure we ask your questions. So I uh, look forward to um, the session here this evening. And Marie, I'm going to hand it on over to you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Jody. Um, good afternoon and good evening, um, everyone, especially for the folks on the East Coast. Um, as Jody mentioned, my name is Marie Gambino, and I am the Field Reimbursement and Payer Solutions Manager for Lung Health. Um, before we get started, if you could please go ahead and aim your phone camera at the attached QR code and uh, take the survey at the end of this pre presentation, we would greatly appreciate the feedback. So I'll just leave this on here for just a second. Okay, before we begin, I do have some disclaimer information that I would like to touch on. Um, today's presentation is for informational purposes only and is not designed to provide any clinical or legal advice. The provider has the sole responsibility to determine medical necessity and to submit the appropriate coding and charges for the care provided. Okay, so the objectives for today's presentation is to familiarize yourself with the changes in reimbursement for procedures performed under both the Illumicide platform and the Legacy Super Dimension navigation system. Um, I'll be focusing primarily on the hospital outpatient reimbursement today, but we'll also be touching on um, a coding change for TTNA and physician reimbursement. Um, I'll also be reviewing the tools and resources available by our team to help minimize any barriers in order to access the ENB technology. And we should have plenty of time um, during this presentation for Q&A. So as Jody mentioned, feel free to reach out with any questions as we go along. Okay, um, effective January 1 of this year, the transthoracic needle aspiration biopsy code or TTNA has changed from 32405 to 32408. Under the previous 32405 CPT code, providers could bill separately for the image guidance. Um, it is important to note, however, that in the facility setting, image guidance was not separately payable. Um, a professional charge by the healthcare provider, however, could be billed and reimbursed. So under this new 32408 code descriptor, the image guidance can no longer be reported as it's part of the CPT code description. And you have the two different definitions there. Okay, we do have some good news regarding the physician payment for 2021. Um, under the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule Final Rule, pulmonologists and thoracic surgeons would have experienced approximately a 9% payment reduction when performed in the facility setting. Um, the $1.4 trillion COVID relief bill that passed in December um, helps to mitigate the impact of the original proposed cuts to physician services. This legislative package uh, does include several provisions that help minimize this physician service payment reduction, and they include a 3.75 increase, which is now reflected in the new fee schedule. The 2% cut on admin taken on each EOB, it's now delayed until at least the end of March. An additional funding um, that was going to be transferred to pay for E&M add-on codes, but this provision is no longer in effect. So overall, the reduction in the Medicare physician schedule payment now averages around 2% nationally for most bronchoscopy codes. So this is great news compared to, to what it looked like um, a few months ago. Okay. 
Okay, now we'll move on to the hospital outpatient update. Um, the reimbursement for bronchoscopy procedures in the hospital outpatient setting has increased approximately 5 to 6% nationally. Um, reimbursement for bronchoscopy procedures under CMS has actually shown um, pretty steady growth year over year. Um, so we have been fortunate. Um, I do want to point out um, on this slide, if you take a look at the CPT code for ENB 31627, um, as you can see, there is no separate reimbursement for this code. Um, it's actually an add-on code, meaning that um, outside of rare exceptions, it's performed in conjunction with another primary service by the same practitioner. So this will be important to remember as we move along um, this presentation. And here are some more um, examples of reimbursement increases that are effective for 2021. Um, and all of these examples are included in the, in the ENB billing guide, along with the ASC and physician allowables. Also keep in mind that these reimbursement rates don't reflect the changes to the 2021 complexity adjustments um, that we're going to be discussing here in a few minutes. Before we dive into the complexity adjustment updates, I did want to remind everyone what APCs are. Um, APCs, or ambulatory payment classifications, are the United States government's method of paying for facility outpatient services for the Medicare program. Um, APCs are an outpatient prospective payment system applicable only to hospitals. Um, this particular slide dives into the progression of the comprehensive APC payment packaging policy that became um, effective back in 2015. This replaced the multiple procedure payment reduction for many surgical procedures, um, bronchoscopy included. The multiple procedure payment reduction means that if a healthcare provider performs multiple procedures during a single patient encounter, Medicare, as well as the majority of commercial insurers, typically will fully reimburse for the highest valued procedure and secondary codes were paid at the 50% reduced rates. So effective in 2017, all bronchoscopy codes were re reimbursed under the comprehensive APC system. This designates a primary procedure um, with adjunctive and secondary services packaged into the payment of the primary procedure. Um, EBIS and TTNA are also paid under the comprehensive APC system in the same way as other bronchoscopies and biopsies are. So using prior claims data, CMS ranks procedures by the mean cost of the procedure. The higher the mean cost, the higher the rank, the higher ranking code is the primary code that receives payment in full. So one example is prior to 2017, when billing for, um, say, a bronchial brushing, fiducial marker placement, ENB, and transbronchial biopsy, the fiducial marker placement would be paid in full, and the remaining codes outside of ENB would be paid at 50%. Um, remember, ENB is a packaged code for hospital outpatient. Under the comprehensive APC payment system, only the fiducial marker placement code would be paid at 100% because it is the highest ranking code. Everything else is packaged into this one payment, so there is no additional payment outside of that. Now, I'm sure many of you remember or are at least familiar with the changes moving bronchoscopy to the comprehensive APC system back in 2017, as this did impact hospital outpatient reimbursement, um, sometimes quite significantly. Um, CMS does recognize that the comprehensive APC system may not accurately reflect total costs associated with these multiple procedures. And in 2015, finalized the comprehensive APC complexity adjustment policy. The complexity adjustments were implemented by CMS to provide for payment adjustment when two or more high cost procedures are performed and paid under Medicare's hospital outpatient comprehensive APC system. Now, to qualify, claims with certain code combinations must meet specific thresholds for both, co for both cost and frequency. If only one of these thresholds are met, the code combination will not qualify. Next, we do have some exciting news um, when you do navigation with bronchoscopy. We actually are really excited about this. Um, new for 2021, when ENB is billed with either a bronchoscopy with brushing or bronchoscopy with lavage, the code pairing qualifies for a complexity adjustment and is reimbursed at the next highest paying APC. So I want to point out um, that 3 point, or 31627 is a packaged code, meaning that there is no separate reimbursement when 31627 is billed under Medicare. 
Effective this year, payment now more than doubles on the national average when bronchoscopy with brushing or bronchoscopy with lavage are performed and billed in conjunction with ENB. So that's exciting. Um, this example illustrates when bronchoscopy with brushing, transbronchial needle biopsy, and EBIS are performed in conjunction with ENB. Um, I wanted to add this specific example in as there are actually two sets of code pairings that would qualify for a complexity adjustment. Um, as we reviewed, when 31623 or a bronchoscopy with brushing is billed in conjunction with 31627, that code pairing does qualify for payment um, at the next highest APC. However, in this example, 31629, which is the transbronchial needle biopsy, billed in conjunction with 31653, um, or EVIS, also qualifies for a complexity adjustment and payment at the next highest paying APC. Since the 31629 is the highest ranking code out of these two scenarios, the complexity adjustment would be adjusted off of the 31629 and 31653 code pairing. So in other words, you won't receive a double complexity adjustment, but will receive an adjustment off of the highest ranking code pair. So you'll see from this um, chart here too, so that payment is a little over $5,800. Um, and if it were actually to be packaged or to be um, paid off of the 31623 and 27 pairing, that would be a, a, just under $3,100. So that there, is, there is quite a difference there. Okay, so we did just review the addition of 31623 and 31624 with uh, 31627 and how these code pairings qualify for payment at the next highest paying APC. So I wanted to show you what that specific scenario looks like if you bill uh, both a bronchoscopy with brushing and a bronchoscopy with lavage, um, and if they're can in con performed in conjunction with ENB. So both 31623 and 31624 billed with 31627 qualify under the complexity adjustment. Um, but 31623 is the highest ranking code between them. So that is the code that is complexity adjusted. Hey, Marie, one quick question for you mm -hmm. from the audience. Um, someone mm -hmm. asked, how about with EBIS? Uh, we do have some scenarios with EBIS as well. Um, those actually aren't on this slide, but I can pull, I can pull up the diagram a little later. It's actually um, the complexity adjustment that was sent out um, that and I can go back to this other example here. Here's one EBIS example with 31653, but also on the guide that was sent out, there's some EBIS examples uh, for code pairings on that as well. But on this previous example is when, where I put in the 31653 EBIS code. We do have a, a couple of, of choices in there. When that's filled with 31629, that does qualify. So it depends on the code pairing. Does that Thank answer you. that question? Okay, sure. Okay. Um, there are several factors critical to determining future reimbursement, and uh, one being the importance of accurate cost reporting. Um, all data needs to be captured as facilities do submit annually all costs surrounding their procedures. Um, that does include personnel costs as well. That reporting is reconciled by CMS and a lump payment is made. Um, if all costs are not accurately captured and reported on, it does impact future reimbursement rates. Eligibility for complexity adjustment is also reviewed annually, and it's critical that all services rendered are billed for. Um, take E&B, for example, um, our new code pairing this year. 31627 is not often billed, as providers know that it's a bundled code under CMS and that some commercial payers still consider E&B to be experimental and investigational. Um, this actually hurts our efforts in the long run when we try to advocate for either increased payment or positive payer coverage. Um, we've been educating accounts on the importance of billing for ENB um, in addition to their other bronchoscopy services, even if payment is not expected. Um, with ENB now meeting the cost and frequency thresholds for the complexity adjustment, billing for a bronchoscopy with a brushing or lavage will now trigger that complexity adjustment. Um, reimbursing at the next highest paying ABC. So correct billing uh, is also crucial when advocating for coverage of new technology. Submitting a code for authorization, even when you know it's going to be denied, is part of the overall payer process. Um, payers are more likely to evaluate for a change in coverage policy if they've received requests for that particular code or technology. Um, I, I spent several years working for um, a large health plan and set in 
on the new technology committee that met monthly. And the first thing that was always discussed was utilization and uh, who was asking for the technology. If no one is asking, it's not really a priority as the reviews are, are already full of technology requests. Um, and when I've personally been able to meet with uh, medical directors in the past uh, to advocate for coverage um, for policy review, the first thing they, they, they do is pull up the utilization or authorization reports um, to see what the activity is. And it's a challenge when a report is pulled and no authorization requests or denials have come through um, because you, you basically have no leverage at that point. When you have that conversation, you actually get to meet with the medical director and you have nothing, nothing for them. Um, it's an uncomfortable conversation and I, I can't stress enough um, how important it is to keep those authorizations coming. Uh, we have several resources available that um, are to help you navigate the sometimes complex reimbursement landscape. Um, you should have received the ENB billing and coding guide prior to this training session. I believe it was sent out in an email. Um, the coding included in this guide are examples of procedures that may be completed with ENB. The rates listed in this guide are based on CMS hospital outpatient, physician, and ASC reimbursement. Um, since multiple procedures can be administered in the same encounter, the payment may be subject to packaging rules, multiple pr procedure reduction, or a complexity adjustment. And none of these billing rules are illustrated in the ENB and billing and coding guide, so keep that in mind. You should also have the new complexity adjustment guide that was sent out as well. Um, this includes the code pairings that, when built together, um, do qualify for a complexity adjustment and payment at the next highest APC. Um, if you'll remember, claims with certain code combinations must meet specific thresholds for both cost and frequency in order to qualify. Um, this guide is inclusive of all qualifying code pairings, including the new pairings for 2021. Um, Maria, I was just going to make one, one uh -huh. comment just here, because I know you've sure. mentioned this a few times and just wanted to be sure. So there was an email that Marie mentioned was sent out to all those who registered. But if by chance, uh, depending upon when you registered, we will ensure that um, the, your email, which we have um, from your registration link, uh, get uh, some of the copies of, of the information here that's being shared. So just know that if you didn't get it, you will be getting it um, uh, in the next 24 hours. So thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Jody. Okay. Uh, the patient selection tool, this was designed to serve uh, multiple functions for customers outside of helping to determine candidacy criteria. Um, so there's a section that includes patient demographics in case the provider wants to submit for authorization or appeals. Um, and the, it's also designed to outline uh, coding with procedures and indications for the procedures. Um, it includes the most common um, documentation requirements to support medical necessity of the procedure. So if that's a resource that would be helpful to you, uh, please reach out to me um, and I can send, that, send you that information or, or have a discussion around that, whatever works for you. Um, we also have a couple of different options regarding appeal resources. There's an appeal letter template available for uh, claims or pre-authorization requests that have been denied. Um, there's also a peer-to-peer -peer template that highlights the information that should be obtained by the provider prior to speaking uh, to the health plan's medical director. Um, it's sometimes beneficial having a phone call between peers so that this is a, this is a great resource um, in order to make sure you have all of your information prior to, to having that conversation. Marie, there's a question that came um, about what about insurance plans that still consider NAVBRONC experimental? Um, which plans? Is that what they're asking? Yeah, so the plan what about insurance plans that still consider NAVBRONC experimental? So the, the plans right now that consider um, ENB to be experimental and investigational are Aetna and um, Anthem. And those are two plans that we're working on um, actively on uh, payer advocacy to, to, to get that coverage changed. Um, pretty much over the past two years, we've gotten, we've been able to overturn um, actually quite a few plans um, to, to have positive um, coverage. But for right now, those are the two that um, are not covering. And those are the two that, that we've been working on actively. So we, we have a plan in place and, and we're moving forward with that. So and if they have questions like that, I'm, I'm happy to answer that as well. If they want a list of certain geography or, or anything like that, um, I can help with that also. Uh, 
Okay, so if you're looking to understand how EMB can support your hospital, we have a number of economic models that are available to illustrate um, different economic scenarios with account specific data points. Um, the economic model is designed to show the ROI to support a capital purchase. Uh, this model illustrates the potential yearly revenue after capital and disposable costs are factored in with specific timeframes. Um, the ENB downstream model is designed to reflect long-term economic value. This model illustrates the potential downstream revenue for an account post-diagnosis. It's driven off of the specific account's incidental lung nodules requiring diagnosis. So it is, it is relevant to those specific data points. The incidental lung nodule or the lung GPS model is designed to show the economic value of an incidental nodule management program. Um, it's designed to identify those patients that present with an incidental finding secondary to their primary condition as the malignancy rate is typically higher. Um, the lung cancer screening model is designed to illustrate the economic value of creating a lung cancer screening program. Nationally, the number of eligible patients that are screened for lung cancer is very low, and this model helps to identify both volumes and the revenue tied to them. So if any of these models interest you, um, please reach out to your Medtronic account manager um, to facilitate the model uh, discussion and creation um, in order to support you in that decision-making process. Um, I just want to point out that I am here to provide any reimbursement support and to participate in any partnership opportunities that can help reduce your barriers um, to reimbursement. They include, you know, being a, a reimbursement subject matter expert regarding coding and payment, um, payer information, um, advocacy. It includes walking through, you know, specific scenarios, um, developing game plans moving forward. Um, we discuss, you know, year-to-year -year changes and opportunities of what additional resources would be helpful, um, not only, you know, with your specific accounts, but also with our, our, par our partners in the field. Um, the ultimate goal is to try to remove any barriers to access um, the ENB technology. Um, we also work on creating healthcare economic models, building and presenting based off of the account-specific data points. Um, and assisting with claim denials that what we talked about a little earlier. Um, and this does go beyond providing an appeal letter or a peer-to-peer -peer resource. Um, we walk through these denials and how they can become future potential payer advocacy efforts. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot that goes into this and there's a lot of partnership involved um, with our providers out there. And, and this is a, a great way to, uh, to get those conversations started um, going through you know, some of these denials that are coming in. We also provide training and education regarding changes to reimbursement on various levels. Um, this can be done in a group setting like this, or it can be done um, with one-on-one -on -one training. So whichever format is best for the customer. Um, so whatever I can do to assist you in obtaining a level of comfort regarding um, you know, all the changes that are happening in reimbursement, um, that's what I'm here for. My contact information is there. Um, feel free to reach out with any questions you may have as you kind of walk through you know, the 2021 reimbursement landscape. So Maria, and again, I have a couple I, of questions. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, so one of the questions from the audience is the physician documents both a lung biopsy, 31628, and a needle aspiration biopsy, 31629, during his navigation bronchoscopy. Should he bill 31627 nav bronch add-on two times or just once? If he's, so billing 31627, 31628, and 31629? So let me read it to you one more time because it's a, it's a little bit complex. So the physician documents both a lung biopsy, 31628, and a needle mm -hmm. aspiration biopsy of 31629 during his nav bronch. Should he bill 31627, which is the nav bronc add on two times or just once? I believe that should be just one time, but let me let me just double check on that because I would still fall under that complexity adjustment as well. Oh no, no, I'm sorry, it doesn't. It doesn't. Let me just double check on that one. Okay. And I'll send that out. Yeah, I'll send that one out. Okay, I've got it captured here, so we we can uh, respond to the audience with a with a follow up email with some of these things. 
here's another question. No, that's um, mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Here's another question. So does 31629 and 31627 qualify for a complexity adjustment? It's okay, not on so the complexity adjustment guide, and it's typically used more than the new code pairings for 2021. Right, and that actually does not qualify for the complexity adjustment for 2021. Um, it does qualify in terms of frequency because it is they are built together quite frequently. It, the cost threshold is not met. And remember when we, when we talked about uh, how cost and frequency have to both be met to, to be able to bump up to that next highest APC um, on the complexity adjustment. So as of right now, that, that code pairing uh, does not qualify, which, which really you know, kind of leads to why it's so important to make sure that, that you're reporting all of your costs involved. Um, I know I did look at this um, pairing before, and, and the cost associated is nowhere near the threshold, which leads me to believe I don't think that the reporting is accurate. Um, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. But as of right now, no, that that code pairing doesn't qualify, and that's just because of the cost threshold. It does not meet it. It does the frequency, but not the cost. What happens in the future? I'm not sure. But as long as you know, we can keep encouraging our providers to make sure that they're um, everything's being captured and everything, all the costs are being reported. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, any, if there's any changes that, that happen in the future, um, that we can kind of move those along. Okay, I have another question. I'm not sure if you're mm -hmm. going to be able to answer this, but it says during an ion bronchoscopy, our billing has a charge for both an EBIS peripheral lesion, 31654, and an EBIS-12 lesion, 31652. Is this correct? Since the EBIS is used to navigate and then for needle aspiration. You said it was for an ion? Yeah. During an ion bronchoscopy, our billing has a charge for both an EBIS peripheral lesion, 31654, and an EBIS-12 lesion, 31654. Five two. Is this correct? Since the EBIS is used to navigate and then for needle aspiration. Okay, yeah, let me check on that one too. I'm going to have to look that one up. So some of these code pairings, we can send that out to everybody. I think that would be good. Um, I just want to make sure to check our system to make sure that they, because there's so many rules involved. So let's look that one up. Okay. We're shooting these questions at you. Here's another one. Yeah. Did payment for TTNA increase with the new coding? So it increased at um, kind of a normal rate, the same normal rate that we have for the rest of the bronchoscopy procedures for um, the hospital side. On the physician side, it actually did increase. Um, and that was a significant increase. Um, so that went from actually $93 to about 155 on the national average. Um, and remember that that code, they it changed from 32405 to 32408 uh, because the imaging guidance was removed. Um, and on the physician side, they were able to bill separately uh, for that piece. So I'm I'm thinking that's what happened this year. Um, why that bump was was significant. I don't know what's going to happen with that next year. Um, but on the hospital side, it, it's the same type of increase as the rest of the bronchoscopy procedures. So for this year, the three two four zero eight did have a little bit of a bump um, to to what, approximately one fifty five on the national average, and that's on the billing guide as well. Okay. Wondering what other questions people have. Um, we certainly have some time, so happy to take any questions that you may have if you just type them into the chat or Q&A. Oh, looks like we've got uh, an option here for another question. Let me see. Does the complexity adjustment affect the payment for the position? The complexity adjustment pertains to um, outpatient hospital reimbursement, so it does not affect physician payment. Physician payment still is subject to to other, um, you know, the, there's still other billing rules, um, but not the not the complexity adjustment. Okay, it looks like another question is coming in. Um, 
I don't know, it says physician. I'm not sure if that was pertaining to the last question. I, the question's now gone because we answered it, but I'm just curious. Um, does your does your question change with regards to the physician at all in that? Maybe that I, I'm not seeing the whole question here, so maybe maybe we're good. Whoever typed that, okay. if you want to, if there's any further clarification or more you'd like, um, oh, it looks like we're good. Okay. Here's another question. Um, mm -hmm. Our hospital billers have always told us not to submit bundled codes because they always drop them before submitting to the payers. If I understand correctly, you are saying we should always submit? Is there any evidence we can give to our billers to support your position? They should be billing for everything that, that they're doing for each individual code. Um, I have not heard that, that they were being drafted before going over to commercial payers. Um, I mean, I would love to have a conversation with them just to kind of get more detail. It sounds like there might be a backstory, but, but they absolutely, even if, if 31627 is a perfect example, even if they know it's not going to be paid, um, even if it is a bundled code and they still need to bill for everything that they're doing just uh, for, for proper billing practices. So um, I, I would suggest, I mean, I would love to have that conversation um, if you want to email me and then maybe we can get something started. I just feel like maybe there's a little more backstory uh, to, as to why they, they don't want to do that. But, um, it, you know, it really does hurt us in the long run if we're not billing for everything. Um, it, it, it just ranges. I mean, you can see what happened to 31627 this year. Just having that in addition um, to the uh, 31623 and 24 is huge. I mean, that more than doubles the payment. Um, and that is basically from just having those those code pairings um, build together, even though 31627 is not separately payable. So we just we have to do that for CMS. We have to do that on the commercial side, um, just so we can get these payers, you know, to over overturn their policy so we can, sh you know, show utilization. Um, it absolutely should be done. So I just would like to have a further conversation if possible on that. And we're capturing all these questions, Marie, with who's asking them, okay. so that's important. But I know we're going to respond to the group with with some replies so that everybody learns from one another's questions. Um, it looks like we've answered all the questions that are in the queue, but happy to take any others. If anybody's got anything, maybe we'll just wait another uh, 30 seconds here to see if something else comes uh, up. And then while, while you're maybe typing, if you have questions um, in the chat feature, for everybody, I did provide Marie's email. Um, so Marie, Marie, you might <laughs> you may be getting some emails from the team. That's okay. Um, That's okay. I just wanted, yeah, to make sure that you had an, uh, an opportunity to to reach out to Marie because she's a wealth of knowledge. So that's in the chat feature, marie.gambino at medtronic.com um, for for your information. And then as well. Uh, we, we mentioned your, your local sales rep um, would be very helpful to you as well in putting you in touch with Marie and getting you what other materials or information you may need uh, for us to assist you with. And it doesn't look like I see any other questions at the moment. So I don't know if there's anything additional you feel like you'd like to add, Marie. Otherwise, I think we will wrap up here this evening and ask that everyone fill out a survey um, that's also another opportunity for you to ask information um, from us. If you want some follow-up information, we're happy to provide that. We will take a look at all the surveys that come in and make sure that we follow up with you directly. And I was just going to add, Jody, if, they, if there's certain code pairings, like the few that came in here, um, if you want to shoot those to me, I can, I can look them up. I just want to make sure that I go through and, and check all of the, the rules and everything before I... Uh, I respond back to you. So happy to help with that as well. Happy to speak to any billers or coders or um, just have those conversations. So just uh, feel free to reach out. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate you attending tonight. This session was recorded and we will send out a copy of this um, once it goes through an approval process and then it does also get hosted up on Medtronic's website. So. Uh, if there's others that would like to um, listen or folks that are within your team that are interested in knowing more, um, just want to make sure that you understand that this will be coming and you'll have the opportunity to share more broadly. So 
With that, have a wonderful evening, Marie. Really, really appreciate your expertise uh, and experience here and sharing the information. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Be safe, and we'll look forward to catching up with you next month on our Wednesday webinar.